So South Georgia is a really significant sub-Antarctic island. It's uh, situated to the east of the Falkland Islands and to the north of the Antarctic Peninsula. And it's a marine protected area uh, and it's also uh, an incredible breeding ground for many of the Southern Ocean penguins, uh, seabirds, seals, whales. So it's been well known for many centuries as a real hotspot for wildlife. And this is a a place we know through the Shackleton story uh, as well. This is where he arrived on that that great quest to rescue his men. Yes, very famous for the historical exploration of Antarctica. It was a stepping off point. It was the last place that ships could refuel and reprovision before going south uh, into the Antarctic. And of course, it was the first place of refuge for many expeditions coming north, and in particular the Shackleton expedition. When I look at satellite images of South Georgia, I see glaciers. So it has a you know, quite a bit of a, a, a glacial history, doesn't it? Yes, it's, it is a heavily glaciated island, particularly along the south coast, but the north coast is quite uh, significantly warmer than the south coast and less exposed to the moisture-laden westerly winds. And so there are large ice-free areas there. And it's these ice-free areas that are absolutely critical breeding grounds for many of the birds and seals that inhabit the Southern Ocean today. Without the small sub-Antarctic islands, many of those species wouldn't have anywhere to breed. They need those ice-free areas. You, Alistair Graham and colleagues, have been looking a bit into the past to try and work out how far some of these glaciers spread out towards the sea, yes? That's right. Uh, We didn't know until recently how big the glaciations have been in South Georgia at the past. New technologies enable us now to map the sea floor and image the sea floor in a way that we haven't been able to before. So traditionally you would rely on little echo sounders on fishing boats telling you how deep the ocean was and you gradually build up a picture of the ocean floor. But now we have instruments that can do very many echo sounds, if you like, all simultaneously and swath, so go from side to side as the ship goes forward and build up an image of the ocean bed. And from that we can see the imprint of very large glaciations that have occurred on South Georgia over the last few glacial cycles. And and you can date them as well because if you if you call the sediments you can tell how far the glaciers were pushing out at a particular time. That's exactly right so we've used an instrument that can penetrate into the bed around the continental shelf and tell us where sediment uh, has been deposited and by taking cores of that sediment we can date uh, when it was deposited because it contains organic matter from dead plankton for example And by getting dates either side of key features like glacial moraines, which are the uh, sort of areas of bulldozed rock created by an advancing glacier, we can date exactly when the glacier left that particular location and retreated back towards the island. So as we look back towards the last ice age, what sort of picture is emerging about South Georgia? So at the last ice age, like many parts of uh, the polar regions, the ice sheet expanded What we didn't know was how far it had expanded. And we know from the recent research now that it expanded almost to the edge of the whole continental shelf. This is not entirely surprising, but what we really needed to know was, as it's expanded so far, how come it's retreated back to where it is today? What was the timing of that retreat? And what were the forcing factors that caused that retreat? And we know now that the South Georgia ice cap was extremely sensitive to even a very small warming at the beginning of the last deglaciation. So walk me through the last 20,000 years. If we go back into the middle of the last ice age, a large ice cap on South Georgia spreading out to, towards the edge of, of the current continental shelf. What happens as we come forward in time? OK, so there's a very large ice cap there, which isn't entirely surprising. But what is surprising is that as soon as the ice cores from Antarctica show that the Earth started warming, the South Georgia ice cap retreated very, very rapidly So from 18,000 years ago, which is quite early in the deglaciation, the South Georgia ice cap had retreated almost back to the island that that we know today. And it carried on retreating. And we know now that there was also, uh, that retreat was punctuated by a re-advance. And that re-advance is something called the Antarctic cold reversal. And that was caused by the large melting of the Antarctic ice cap, putting a a layer of fresh water onto the ocean, which caused more sea ice to grow. And and in 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 a sense, that halted the deglaciation for a few thousand years uh, and then the deglaciation carried on and we can see that even that very small response is seen quite markedly uh, in the glaciers on South Georgia. And one should say that in the last what 100 years, 150 years, 200 years uh, there's been a bit of an acceleration as well in the retreat of the remnant glaciers that are there. 
Yeah, so many of the glaciers in South Georgia, when they w the island was first visited and first photographed 100 or so years ago, were what's called tidewater glaciers. They extended out into the fjords. But since then, most of those, I think there's only two or three uh, that aren't retreating, but most of those have retreated, and they've retreated quite markedly and quite rapidly up into the, into the mountains. Um, this has had a lot of implications for some of the the uh, invasive species that have been on the islands because they've been able to travel between areas of the islands that were previously cut off by glaciers. Rats, for instance, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, rats, mice, reindeer, and rats were the particular problem on South Georgia because many of the birds are burrowing birds and uh, the rats would go into the burrows and kill the, uh, the fledglings. So it's uh, been a, a big effort in the last few years to eliminate those invasive species. So tell us about the wider picture now, because this has implications for how we might understand that further south might react, the Antarctic Peninsula, what sort of implications there are for warming in that region. So yeah, South Georgia is a really perfect place to study because it's just slightly further north than the Antarctic Peninsula. So it's showing us what the response is of an ice sheet to really very moderate changes in temperature, both in the ocean and the atmosphere. And we can then take those responses and push them further south as climate warms and get a very good idea of what might happen to the Antarctic Peninsula ice sheets and indeed any ice sheet that's really near the, the thermal limit of being able to survive. But the message here is that we think these systems are quite sensitive to small temperature changes. Yes, they are. They're very sensitive. Uh, to see the imprint of the past glaciations around South Georgia, you can see multiple small advances and retreats and they're all going to be driven by moisture supply and temperature. Those two factors are the main factors in ice sheet growth and retreat. And we can see that the South Georgia ice cap is really sensitive. And by using that sensitivity and applying it to ice sheets further south, we can tune the models to better reproduce what the effects of an increased ocean temperature or an increased atmospheric temperature will be in the next few hundred years. Now explain this to me because South Georgia biologically is very important isn't it? Yes. There's a lot of endemic species there. If there was this giant ice cap how could that be because you know in order to to have these species there they must have been there for a very long time and yet conditions in the fairly recent past, the recent geological past, would seem that it was pretty tough. Yeah, so we know we know that there are endemic species on the island. Some of the some of them have been well known for decades. So endemic, there's an endemic duck called the South Georgia pintail, for example. But others have only been revealed by looking at their DNA and realizing that they are quite different from uh, other species around the Southern Ocean, and that they only occur on South Georgia. And this is particularly so in the marine environment. So some of the benthic marine species. And in order to have evolved uniquely on South Georgia, there must have been areas of the continental shelf and there must have been areas on land where these endemic species would have been able to survive these massive glacial cycles that have happened in the last few hundred thousand years. So there were refugia, even in amongst this giant ice cap, there must have been places where it was reasonably ice free. I think that's absolutely right. I don't think this was a very sort of a large dome that covered the entire island and then spread out as a dome to the continental shelf. What it was was a very, very active series of glaciers that, if you like, fingered their way out from the main ice sheet, but they were flowing fast. We can see that from the imprint on the continental shelf. And so the glaciers concentrated all that ice flow into particular areas and carved deep troughs into the continental shelf. But between those areas where the glaciers were flowing fast were areas where they were flowing sh fl slower or areas where indeed they could have remained ice free so some of the ends of the northern peninsulas, for example, may well have remained ice-free over several glacial cycles. And we can see there that the rocks are much more eroded than in other parts of the island. So there's a potential for those are, ha, having been the areas for, for species to survive. 